Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. To the penultimate for now episode of Masters of Carpentry, a John Carpenter podcast where we talk about all things Carpenter all the time. I am one of your hosts, Alex, and joining me as usual is Noel. Oh, penultimate. We're that close to the end. Oh my God. I know. I never thought I'd see the day. And also joining us again. Again. It's Melissa Kirscher. Hello. Hi, it's good to be back as always. Penultimate, that's amazing. I know. Wow. We've been at this for almost four years. I was going to ask yep. when you started. 1963. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Alex has had mm. a kid in the time since we started this. Yeah. <laughs> On top of the one he already had. That had to be tricky for your wife. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> but um, shh. <laughs> Here's a question, Alex. Was your first child the same age as your second child is now when we started? Uh, pretty sure she was younger. I'm pretty sure okay. she was... I don't know if she was a year. I can't remember exactly when we started. When was it? Do you remember the exact date when we started? Was it like 2014 or something like that? 2014? Okay. Then she would have been a bit older then. Wow. So much time. Indeed. Well, we still have the ultimate episode in which we'll definitely be reminiscing about this longer journey we've been on. Mm -hmm. For sure. Oh, I just looked it up. 2013. Okay, that makes more sense. September. Yeah. Wow. Wow. September 2013, then she would have been a year and a half, so a bit older than her sister. Wow. Yeah. Almost done with John Carpenter, and he's pretty much done by now, too. So That's Aww. true. He'll hopefully still have some more things coming up to talk about. He's still around. Oh, yeah. That's true. But yeah, tonight we're talking about his second episode of Masters of Horror, done for the second season of the series, Pro-Life. Mm-hmm. Interesting follow-up to Cigarette Burns. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to have much in the way of production credits, because again, the series is created by Mick Garris. This was its second season. The script was again by Drew McQueenie and Scott Swan. And we kind of covered them all in the last episode. Just kind of refer back to that for who all was involved. I can't remember if this led to the war. I remember cigarette burns suddenly got a whole lot of buzz mm -hmm. because everyone was like, ooh, John still got it. And then this one came out and I didn't really hear anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we'll probably get to why. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, the only thing I really have to add is the date of this episode was October 27th. So it was a Halloween episode in 2006, probably about a decade later than it looks like it was made. <laughs> yeah. I agree. At its core, pro-life is the culmination of a feud between men on both sides of the abortion debate. On the one, Dwayne Bursell, a deeply religious and deeply pro-life protester and family man. On the other is Kiefer, a hard-nosed doctor in charge of the local women's health clinic. When a battered teenage girl named Angelique is found on the road, she's brought to the clinic to make sure she's okay, and a series of discoveries are made. One, she's Dwayne's daughter. Two, she's pregnant. Three, she desperately wants an abortion. And four, Dwayne and his sons are in a van outside the gate demanding to have her released. Kiefer and crew refuse on all counts, wanting to make sure the girl hasn't succumbed to foul play on her father's part, and the escalating waiting game comes to a head when Dwayne cuts the phone lines, arms his boys, and comes in guns blazing. It's not long before people on both sides are dead and Dwayne and Kiefer are in a standoff. Dwayne ultimately gets the upper hand and decides to make a point by cutting Kiefer open between the legs and hollowing him out with the vintage abortion equipment on display in the doctor's office. Oh boy, that scene. Yeah. <laughs> While that's been going on, the other doctors are quickly discovering that Angelique's pregnancy is unusual. By her account, the baby was conceived just a week ago, even though it appears months old and quickly continues to grow, and an ultrasound goes weird when the baby attacks the camera from within the womb. According to Angelique, she was pulled into the ground and raped by a demon, and the baby is the result, with her father unaware that the ethereal voice telling him to protect the baby is coming from somewhere other than the heavens. It's not long before Angelique goes into labor, giving birth to an unholy attempt to mix Rob Bottin's head crab with a very rubber cabbage patch doll. <laughs> 
<laughs> yep. well, well, well said. Well said. The birth allows the demon himself to rise to the surface as he roars a lot and kills through some people. But just as he makes it to the delivery room, Angelique puts a bullet through the head of the newborn. The sulking demon returns to the depths with his dead baby as Angelique declares, God's will is done. So, Alex, <laughs> do you have any kind words to say about pro-life? It was my favorite. No, it's terrible. I hated it. It's uh, <laughs> lifeless, listless, and pointlessly nasty. I just did not care for it. Melissa, do you recommend pro-life? I don't because I don't think it comes together in the end. I think the concept, the original concept is really strong because I think horror, when it is used to kind of needle at societal ouch points, can be really, really great as Get Out has been demonstrating this movie season. Mm -hmm. But it has to be really well done. And oh, this isn't, which really is sad because when I heard about the concept of this, it's like, yeah, yeah, I feel like that really hasn't been explored in anything else I've seen. It's just a great concept, and I was excited to see what it turned into, and oh boy, it just kind of was ham-handed where it really shouldn't have been, and gratuitous where it shouldn't have been. It's hard for me to say what exactly could have been done to save it. I mean, it suffers from really cardboard characters. There's this lack of subtlety. It just kind of falls apart, and it doesn't really have the style of John Carpenter. I mean, it just feels really phoned in. Except for Ron Perlman, who can yes. elevate any material he is given, no matter how shitty, because he is an amazing actor. He brings it, yes. Yes, he was the Udo Kier of this one. <laughs> oh God, he was. And I was happy to watch it just to watch Perlman work, mm -hmm. because he really is great. And I also don't recommend it. It definitely suffers from what I call the Wolf Blitzer effect. Oh, <laughs> Oh, oh, where it is both over the top and exaggerated while also being ridiculously bland and flat. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's a term I've coined for multiple years and I continue to apply it here. I can see the little trademark in the corner. That's very nice. Well done. Yeah, it's over the top and hammy, but it's not campy or fun or silly. It's also just very flat and blandly made. It looks cheap. I mean, if you had shown this to me cold, not knowing a thing about it, I would have guessed it was an early 90s episode of The Outer Limits. Yeah, I could see that. Or something made around that time. It has that same very cheap, quickly put together production values. And if I had gone in thinking it was some little mid-90s TV anthology thing, I'd say, hey, this is okay. It's clumsy and clunky as hell, but for what it is, it has some interesting things about it. If you had told me that this was directed by John Carpenter and that he made it in 2006... I would have said, get out and don't speak to me again. <laughs> <laughs> you are banished from this house. <laughs> uh... Yeah, it has a neat hook. Yeah. It has a neat idea, but it just feels so weirdly... I don't want to say wrong because it's kind of intentionally wrong, but it feels very wrong in how they went about doing what they did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can see the thought processes and what they're intending to do here, but it's not doing it the right way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like they had to go in one of two directions with it. They had to go campier or they had to go more serious and they stuck right in the middle. So it either had to be like that really over the top scene where Ron Perlman is using the vintage abortion instruments mm -hmm. on the guy. It had to go either in that direction or it had to tone things down and work more subtly. Make it more of a philosophical clash. Yeah, make it more philosophical. And maybe the reveal of this is demon baby, hold it a little close to the chest yeah. for longer and really <laughs> make it kind of this solid debate between poor life and poor choice. And then when you get into it, you know, it's the old debate point of what if that baby grows up to cure cancer? Well, what if he's Hitler? You know, that's just <laughs> he could also be Hitler or a demon in this case. The Antichrist could be a pop star who brings joy to millions. That's right. Give him a chance. <laughs> So yeah, it's filled with so many possibilities and none of them really fulfilled. It's interesting because even listening to the commentary and the interview with the writers, they wanted to do this story without giving one side a head over the other. And I, I kind of get that. I do like that the Ron Perlman character is not played as like an over the top Bible thumping yeah. tell and damnation guy. There are parts of him that are almost noble. You know, he genuinely believes in what he's doing. 
He's true to his family. He really loves his kids. He's not like forcing them. Like you have the one kid who says, I can't go in there with you. I can't do this. He's like, that's fine. Just wait out here. Mm -hmm. There are moments of gentleness from him. Mm -hmm. And I like that. But the problem is it's like they don't want to get into it to the point where you don't really have those clashing philosophies. Yeah. And I feel like the Ron Perlman character that we see earlier, the okay, son, you can wait out here, is the same guy who went in and gutted the doctor with vintage abortion instruments. That's not a guy who's interested in revenge. He's interested in getting his daughter back. I know the writer said the moment they conceive this story, they're like, oh, we have to have an abortion performed on the abortionist as like our big climactic point. And it's like, do you? I get the impulse. Yeah, but it's... It comes so out of nowhere. It comes out of nowhere and it feels very... Pornographic. (laughs) Yeah, it feels like we just wanted to have this scene here, so we're putting this scene here, and it didn't feel driven by the character. I mean, if it was a different character that was established earlier as being the even crazier than Ron Perlman, Ron Perlman, Mm -hmm. and like he went in with that character and maybe the Ron Perlman character walks in on that and goes, oh, oh, that's not what I'm on board for. Yeah. I feel like, yes, you could have that scene, but even have the pro-life guy going, oh, I don't like this abortion doctor, but oh, damn, that's sick. Yeah. (laughs) I'm very much on the pro-choice side of the abortion debate, and so I'm on the the side of the doctors, but it's hard to take the side of the doctors because those characters aren't fleshed out very well. No. What's interesting is that they never really actually give voice to their side of the debate. Right. They're just kind of there. They're played as victims, but they're not. They're played as very antagonistic at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And they don't really give the daughter much say either. I mean, no. kudos to her for, you know, being the one to put the bullet in the head of the spider baby. But yeah, she's not really fleshed out either. So I feel like they had to maybe have half the number of characters and really focus in on what each of them was going to do. Or more running time. Or more running time. You know, there were still other things that would have to be fixed. Well, and one of the interesting things about the doctor is I did read the script even though it was the shooting script there were a few differences when the doctor was pulling out the bulletproof vest and was putting it on he was supposed to take his shirt off and you were supposed to see scars from bullet wounds from the reason why the Ron Perlman character has the restraining order is he took shots at this doctor in the past oh that would have been good to know so it's like there is a history there that they never really reveal see that uh... There's so many missed opportunities here and it just pisses me off. You want to know the odd thing from the commentary? And I don't know if he was like this just because John was in the room. Drew McQueenie and Scott Swan were like, never did we imagine that we would ever see our words brought to life on screen so perfectly. Oh boy. They were gushing about this episode. Alice, what did you think of Bill Dow as Dr. Kiefer, kind of the other side of that debate? Which one was he, the handsome doctor or like gun shooting? The older one with the guns. Oh, um, the killer slash (laughs) hard-boiled? Yeah, he was fine. He seemed like an extra from the X-Files to me. Like this whole thing felt like it was shot just outside of Vancouver. And like a Day of the <laughs> Dead kind of set. <laughs> yeah. That's why it was so weird. It felt so otherworldly. I'm like, is this like in a post-apocalyptic society? Like, what's going on here? Yeah. yeah why is the abortion clinic out in the middle of the woods? Yeah. yeah. Where it's vulnerable. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, it's out in the middle of nowhere. There could be an attack and no one would even hear about it. Yeah. Yeah, he did an all right job, I guess. Like, you didn't really get to know him or anything. I've never been into an abortion clinic, but I imagine there's a lot of, like, caring individuals there who are there to put young women at ease and like people who are like really passionate about what they do helping poor distressed women and just in general i did not get the sense of that he seemed like uh he was running a military base and he was frustrated and expecting attack all the time which i guess is fair if they had that backstory but in this instance with so little to go on it just felt like a weird scenario i thought she was getting into trouble with these people and that they were going to be evil and they were going to kind of like flip the script on that whole thing it's cult of the thorn man Cult of the Thorn. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Cult of the Thorn kind of thing. But no, no such luck. And that office just looked like a 1980s real estate office, which I didn't understand. Yeah, it did. And why did the room that the poor young lady was being treated in, why did it have like panoramic windows? Yeah. I don't know. Because, oh my God, like 98% of women would not even enter a room like that going... Well, I'm going to be up in stirrups with things going into the yin-yang, and I don't want panoramic windows in here. It's an emotional experience, too. Yeah. Yeah. I have not gone through such a procedure, but I've gone through tumor removals and things like that, and ultrasounds. 
procedures like that tend to be handled in very intimate environments. Yeah. It's a small room. There's like natural filtered lights, but there's not an open window or anything. And everything's kind of beige and mm-hmm. you know, lights are low and it's supposed to be relaxing and people are just very quiet and calming. So that's what I expect that sort of experience to be similar to. It seems like he likes his job a bit too much. I don't know any abortion yeah. doctors, and I can't say for certain, but I'm pretty sure abortion doctors aren't also abortion enthusiasts and collectors of memorabilia. That was very strange to me. <laughs> and if you were, you would not keep it in your fucking office on site. Yeah. That is a very odd thing to do. <laughs> right? Because I feel that would not put women at ease. No. Because, oh boy, no. <laughs> is David Cronenberg running this office? No. I don't want to be treated by the twins from Dead Ringers. I really don't. <laughs> And the early stuff is very horrifying to look at. That would make everyone just change their mind just for being afraid of the procedure. Yeah. Yeah, because, oh my god, that's... no. But what's also (laughs) interesting is they never really establish that equipment as being there. We don't even notice it's there until Ron Perlman goes up to it and starts playing with it. That's true. Right. So it's like Deus Ex abortion equipment. Well, and (sighs) then that also ties into things that we mentioned in the last movie, how they never do visual establishment of the environment. Yeah. There is this odd laziness to the direction. And Mm -hmm. the crew is entirely the same. Same cinematographer, editor, production designer, set people, all that stuff as cigarette burns. That's surprising to me because the other one looks and is so much more amazing, like like compared to this one. Cigarette Burns could get a theatrical release. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. This could be playing back to back with an episode of Poltergeist The Legacy. Absolutely. <laughs> Ouch. Oh, hold on. I've got it. Chekhov's abortion equipment. Oh, <laughs> oh, 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 that gives me a lot of questions about Star Trek now. Yeah. <laughs> And like, I didn't even name them in the synopsis, but yeah, we had Mark Feuerstein as Alex mm-hmm. and Emmanuel Vanier as Kim, the kind of lead couple who work at the clinic. Mm-hmm. Who, they don't really have an arc. They're just kind of there carrying us through scenes. Yeah. Very dull, but they do get a killer line out at one point. The high point of the episode for me. Is it safe? How the fuck should I know? <laughs> yeah. Like I said, I feel like this could have been done with half the characters and it would have been a lot stronger. Yeah. Yeah. I was so excited. It was a siege, a potential John Carpenter siege. I was so excited. Mm-hmm. It was such a bummer. It was just handled like everyone seemed so bored. And <laughs> yeah, it's probably his least Rio Bravo. Yeah. Of all of his yeah. siege movies. And he's made a lot of siege movies. As soon as the van showed up, I'm like, oh my God, we're going to get a Carpenter siege. Yeah. And it was just like, yeah, here we go. Let's do this. Okay. Yeah, we've got a checklist. Mm. Yeah, we'll skip those. What if we cut out the additional family in the waiting room? What if it was one person driving down the road who almost runs over the girl and goes back to the clinic and it's closed for the day, but there's one other doctor who's still there. So it's the trio inside. And then maybe it's Ron Perlman, like an older son who is the really sick one. And then a third younger son, and he's the one that's like, I don't know about this. And those are the only characters you deal with in the entire thing. So maybe there is still the security guard because he needs somebody to die early. And I really actually like the security guard because he was yeah. just so nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I feel like that was a fairly well done bit part character. and mm-hmm. Not a well done gore effect, but a good character. Yeah. Oh, God. Digital blood. That was pretty uh, bad. <laughs> Oi, Gavalt. <laughs> but yeah, so maybe a security guard in the middle, you know, kind of garden the gate mm-hmm. in between the two. But yeah, just paring it down in that way, I think would have streamlined a lot of it. Let me get it to what they talked about in terms of the development of the story on this. McQueenie and Swan, both this and Cigarette Burns were initially treatment outlines that they had for feature films Mm -hmm. that they then sold to Masters of Horror and redeveloped. And Cigarette Burns just came to Carpenter, but they specifically brought him the original outline to this and then developed it into a script with John Carpenter. Oh my. Wow. So he did actually supervise the development of the script. And I will say, having read the script, I think it actually did work better on paper than it did on film because it wasn't poorly shot and cheap. Mm -hmm. But initially, their first draft of the script had no supernatural element. It was a pure siege film. Oh. Okay. Oh. And that's actually why Masters of Horror initially passed on it for season one because they wanted something with a supernatural twist. Oh. Mm -hmm. Wow. So then, working still with Carpenter, that's when they brought in the whole demon angle. Which does feel kind of tacked on now that you've described it in that way. 
almost as glued on as that baby head. <laughs> oh, ouch. Oh, that head crab just made me want to watch the thing again and throw bricks at this. Well, yeah, because <laughs> you want to see that done well. Because nobody does spider baby head, well, spider human head like early John Carpenter. I would like to have seen Rob Bottin do Evil Infant. Mm, yes. With spider legs. It was Greg Nicotero, wasn't it, who was working on this, right? Yeah, but I've had my issues with K&B in the past. I know. I know, but every once in a while... Well, just because it's KNB doesn't mean it's all Greg Nicotero. Nicotero mostly did the big demon suit, which was good. Yeah, the demon suit was yeah, lovely. Yeah, he looks pretty good. I've always found Nicotero to be talented, but everyone else at KNB to kind of be a little more down post. Hmm, fair. I would really actually genuinely love to read the original version of when this was just a pure siege story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Whereas then going to be the big climactic sequence was going to be the abortion. And I would just be curious to see how that would have played. Because mm -hmm. you would have had more time to focus on building to that moment and building the escalation of events. Yeah, I feel like that would have been a stronger story. Because once again, it's paring it down from what it turned into. I mean, we could have had Red State before Red State. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Because <laughs> Red State, love it or hate it, there is energy, there is commitment. He is like diving headfirst into everything he did in that movie. This one, it's like John just doesn't care. Yeah, it was so phoned in. It, I don't know what happened. It's just a real bummer. And as yeah. I mentioned to Melissa earlier, Alex, the audio commentary with John Carpenter and the writers, mm -hmm. 10 minutes in, John is like, I got to go take a smoke break. You guys just keep going without me. <laughs> That kind of sums up. <laughs> and then it's just like 15 minutes of the writers talking and John going like, did I miss anything? <laughs> you did not, John. Oh, you did not. <laughs> and then it's like him just kind of asking them questions. And at the end, he's like, and these two guys were great. And I was here. <laughs> he's checked out. For as much celebration as the I don't give a fuck attitude gets at times, there is a very double-edged sword to that where you just become so dispassionate that it's hard to care about you when you don't care about anything. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's just disappointing. And John just doesn't give a shit anymore. No. And it's like, this is his big follow-up to cigarette burns, which, you know, again, wasn't the most John thing, but there was energy there. There was a sharpness to it. Mm-hmm. It was fine. It's not in my top five Carpenter things, but I can see how like after the run that he had and then the gap in his career to have that suddenly come out, it's like a breath of fresh air. Yeah, I was super stoked to see it. It's like that John Carpenter still exists in there somewhere. It was just a glimpse, you know? What this brings to mind is John Carpenter's Village of the Damned. Mm -hmm. And I think they made the baby puppet even worse. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, when that came out, I was just like, the first thing that came into my head was like, did somebody order the crab? <laughs> oh, <laughs> and God. I love how they're trying to sell it with, you know, they, they even uh, Cody Carpenter did the score again. And even he did those very electronic screechy sounds as the baby's being born. Yeah, it was like a British documentary. <laughs> but it's like they're doing that slow motion where they're just chopping frames out and it's all stuttery and the legs yeah. look awful and the baby looks awful. And <laughs> yep. <laughs> You know what my wish would have been? What is your Christmas wish? Now, what is your wish? If they had been able to get George Romero for Masters of Horror, oh. I think he would have been a great fit for this material and probably would have even polished it up a little better. Oh, yeah. Mm, I could see that. That'd be interesting. Romero is himself hit or miss, but he's always thoughtful. And I would have yeah. been curious to hear the philosophies he would have explored with this. Mm -hmm. I feel like he's also a little bit more socially aware. Yeah. And John has had socially aware movies like They Live and some other things. But John is well, yeah. kind of more, you know, the stripped down, lean and mean, in the moment type thing. Yeah. This just doesn't really feel like material that I would think of with John. I mean, like the siege aspect, but the siege isn't even the main focus of the story. Right. Whereas Romero would be the abortionist versus the anti-abortionist and like the culmination of their feud mm -hmm. as violence erupts. I could see him really making something of that. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of want to see, going back to David Cronenberg, the early version of the script without the demon baby. Take that, give it to Cronenberg. And not mm. necessarily 80s Cronenberg, which would have given us dead ringers. I'm talking about the Cronenberg that gave us Spider and who gave us Eastern mm. Promises and a history of violence and give him that sort of material. Oh, wouldn't that be interesting? Mm -hmm. God, an Eastern Promises style abortion sequence. <laughs> right? <laughs> Jesus. That Cronenberg is so good with character and so good with finding these little niches of human behavior and just sinking hooks into them. That's in my dream sequence. That's in my headcanon. That's in my parallel universe that I want to visit someday. 
I'm sure we can all agree, though, don't let Tom Six direct it. Oh, God, no. No, no. Uh Uh-uh. You know if they did Masters of Horror today, they would have him do an episode. Oh, God, I know. I know. I will say that Tom Six does great opening night parties. (laughs) (laughs) I think the main problem with this is they had a great hook, but they kind of half-heartedly approached it. Mm -hmm. It needed to be deeper and rawer and more openly about the rage fuel debate. Mm -hmm. You could still play both sides kind of evenly, which, to be fair, Red State does not. Well, Red State is just everyone's awful. Yeah. I don't want everyone to just be awful, but it'd be kind of neat to see the more nuances of both sides, you know? I would have been interested to see maybe something like this done in a Joe Dante style. Mm. Because Joe Dante, for the first season of Masters of Horror, did just a knock the ball out of the park episode called Homecoming, which is amazing. And it's bonkers in all the best Joe Dante ways. Isn't that the one where all the soldiers come back to life? Yep. But it's this evisceration of the Bush administration. It just guts it. And it was so satisfying to see it during those years. Um, So I feel like, you know, some of it wouldn't necessarily date well, because, you know, now we're a couple presidents ahead. I think people are a little overly critical about things dating themselves. Things are allowed to be of their moment. There's nothing wrong with that. That is exactly what homecoming was meant to be is the this is right now. And we're seriously worried about this country Mm -hmm. because, oh, God, have you seen who's steering the ship? But there are just very pointed references at Ann Coulter and Bill O'Reilly and just one by one, it goes to Joe Dante land. And so it's like really overt satire of the modern political landscape at the time, plus zombies. (laughs) But it's also black comedy because, you know, that's what Joe Dante does best. And so I feel like this such a hot cultural touch point would have been interesting if you took it in a different direction. If you're going to go demon baby, you better go full on satire. You got to go completely over the top and then let that float you through. But like I said, they stuck to the middle of the road blandness when they had to veer off to one side or the other, and they just never did. And also what's interesting is the lack of payoff in terms of when he's giving the doctor the abortion, the doctor's pretty much already dead. Yeah. Because when he like puts that suction machine in, you don't see the body react. You don't get a reaction shot on the face. He's basically just doing this to a corpse to prove a point. It's yeah. weird. It's really weird. And it doesn't feel driven by that it's character. It's shot weird. But then even further than that, you have Ron Perlman face to face with the demon and realizes that that's been the voice of God he's been hearing. And then we never see Ron Perlman again. Yeah. It's like we get to the point where the tables have been philosophically turned on both these people, but we never really get to explore any genuine emotional fallout from it from either of them. Yeah. And why would the Perlman character take all that time to eviscerate the doctor when his primary driving force is to get his daughter out of there? Yeah. Exactly. It does not make sense. It doesn't make sense at all. I think it would have been more suited to where the doctor's been shot, he's been disarmed, and Perlman just leaves him there with one of his sons watching, and it's the son who's the twisted one. Yeah. Who starts to look around at the equipment and get the idea while Ron is still looking for his daughter. Yeah. I would have actually had Ron be in the room for the birth of the child, and as the child comes out, suddenly everything comes to light for him, you know? You didn't even need the giant demon coming. Why did you even have that? Just the baby. You don't need the demon rising out of the earth. You just need the awareness of, no, this child doesn't belong here. Yeah. Particularly not in this poor girl's uterus. Right. Yeah, it just feels like, again, they have interesting ideas, but they never really figured out how to put them together. Yeah. And, you know, we kind of had similar issues with cigarette burns, but it still worked for the most part. The problems with cigarette burns were relatively minor. This is, like, overwhelming. Yeah, It's not there yet. Right, right. And it needs work. Definitely. And then, yeah, the score by Cody Carpenter is, it's fine. It's fine. But it's not very noticeable. Right. Mm -hmm. There's so much else that's going wrong. It's like the score is the least of our problems. (laughs) Oh, man. It's just, oh, what a mess. It's very disappointing. It's sad. It's not even a thing that makes me angry. Because, I mean, you know, I'm very much a pro-choice person myself, and You'd think seeing the whole abortion sequence would be his, but it's just kind of like, 
Really? Yeah. <laughs> well, when something like this is so badly put together, you can't get involved in it. Nothing has any impact. Yeah, there are all these things that should really get into you no matter what side of the debate you're on. But it just doesn't work to such a level that you can't be ours to care. Yeah. And it's like in John, it's like all of his composition is gone. All mm -hmm. of his slick editing is gone. Mm -hmm. All of his tight character work is good. There's nothing of John Carpenter in this. Right. I mean, in the last episode, we were like, you know, hey, he works pretty well as a director for hire doing just commercial stuff. Ooh. Yeah. Boy, would he be inconsistent. I feel like, yes, he's burned out and probably mostly burnt out long, long ago. I'm wondering if he's just more about the music these days and he's more, that's just what he's more excited about and going out and performing live. I think the music was a good comeback after his eye injuries. Yeah. I know he was pretty despondent over that and then that's been great bringing him back out. But mm -hmm. I don't think he wants to direct again. Yeah, I don't think he does. Even though he signed like a deal to direct four TV pilots. But that was like over a year ago and we haven't heard anything since. Right. I just don't think his heart's in it. I don't even think it's like a depressing thing or anything. I think he just likes hanging out with his family and just doing his own thing. Yeah, he deserves a retirement. The man's old. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, cigarette burns would have been a great Matadayo to go out on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just showing him one or two things like Hitchcock with Frenzy or like, hey, I can still do this. Yeah. But then he made Family Plot. Uh... That's true, yeah. I mean, that's always the thing is you get those directors who they go out on a great note. And then they go one further. Although I will That's say, true. Family Plot is a hell of a lot better. Than, family Plot's fun, yeah. Than pro life. Well, and this is you's last note. We still got the ward. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah oh, that's yeah. true. That's true. I love John Carpenter. I've just dedicated almost four years of my life to a show about John Carpenter. It's always sad when you get to this point where it just isn't working anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I don't even blame him because, yeah, he's been burned so many times. He just doesn't care anymore. You can't really blame him for that, but it's still sad to see. Yeah, and I, I feel like, I don't know how he feels about the fandom that has grown up around him. There were generations of people still discovering his films, and, you know, they still want to see him talk about his older work. And I'm wondering if he's like, eh, I'm done with it. Yeah. And he just keeps getting pulled in kind of unwillingly into these projects. It's like, yeah, I guess these people want me to come back, and I guess I still kind of want to do this. And then he gets there, it's like, Ah, this is work, yeah. and I really don't want to do this anymore. For anyone who's hoping, there's reasons why I have no intention of actually approaching John Carpenter for an interview. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Beyond the yeah. fact that we are also a very small show, and that would probably cost money, I worry that it would just not go well. Because mm -hmm. I've seen interviews with him recently where it's like he just has no interest in talking about things. Yeah, he's just kind of checked out. And to be fair, it's because people keep asking him the same damn questions over and over again. Yeah. So tell me about Halloween, you know? <laughs> yeah, he's heard the same damn question since 1978. Yeah. I'm sure that we're not going to come up with new questions after all this time. I mean, I'll probably be the only one who will openly ask him about Zuma Beach, but I doubt he'll want to talk about that either. That's probably mm -hmm. true. Probably be like, well, sadly, I wasn't there when Suzanne Summers was in the swimsuit. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> I love John, but it's sad to get to these waning years. And he's still yeah. around. He's, you know, it's like talking about him like we lost him. Yeah, well, <laughs> well we kind of did. Yeah. But again, yeah, his music. I've really been loving his music. Yeah, mm -hmm. he's a great composer. And the whole recent era of comic books that he was directly involved in, we're actually going to be getting to those here in a few months. Oh, good. I'm glad that he's still putting stuff out. I would love to see more work by him in film and TV, but stuff like this makes me also kind of glad that we're not, because probably half of it would be disappointing. Right. And if it's not what he wants to do, it's not going to be good. Yeah, you're just forcing it. I mean, I think Cigarette Burns was like, hey, it's a great kind of get out of a rut, shake mm -hmm. off the rust, go out and do something again. And this one feels like an obligation. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it does. But Ron Perlman's great. Ron Perlman's great. And that crew cut. Uh-huh. Crew cut works really well on Brown Perlman. Highlights the jaw. Yeah, it really does. Uh -huh. and, and what a jaw. What a jaw. There's no other jaw like that. <laughs> well, jabber jaw. I don't agree. <laughs> but I do like jabber jaw. That's a completely different thing. I don't know how that came into this. Cold medication. <laughs> <laughs> I blame you. I blame you, No. Yes. <laughs> yeah, how much Sudafed did you take? Uh, the Sudafed's <laughs> actually wearing off. <laughs> That might be your problem. That's why I've been muting the mic several times. <laughs> Wonderful coughing fits. Mm, mm. But yeah, no, no, pro-life. Alex, any final thoughts on pro-life? What a bummer. Yeah. 
Yeah. I can't get mad at it. I can't get anything about it. It's just, I don't know. Yeah, it's just there. It happened. <laughs> it's kind of depressing. Yeah, it's like Halloween 5. It's just there. Yeah. But we got through it. We did an episode. <laughs> Go us. Even Halloween 2 was better than this. Just stuck mostly in a hospital. Oh my god, yes. <laughs> and it actually looked like a hospital. Yeah, it did. Just a little tension. That was really all I was going to ask for. I didn't even have to ask for anything to make sense. Just a little tension. And I uh, denied. Melissa, any final thoughts? So in my head canon, we rewrite the script and we get the rights and we rewrite the script because, you know, it's over 10 years old now. You know, mm -hmm. we can do a remake. Make it work. And then we contact David Cronenberg's kid because mm -hmm. he's making movies now. <laughs> and then, see, I've got a plan. I've got a plan. But <laughs> yeah. it's just because I don't want to see this just the core ideas are good. And it's just disappointing to me to see it just lay there. It never yeah. came together. But again, I, yeah. I would love to read that original Siege version of the script, but even the one mm -hmm. that I read, it read fine. It read, I could see the potentials for the idea there, but it just, oh, yeah. none of it blew me away. Mm -hmm. And this is something that should be striking, that should just like grab you and surprise you and be like, oh, wow, they went there. And it doesn't. And there are a few attempts to are just kind of like, really? And it doesn't help that it's so cheaply shot, filmed on whatever location they could find. And all the core effects are just so cheap and silly. Yeah. All of them. Like the neck shot and the head shots and the gut shot and that baby. God, that baby. I wonder <laughs> if I could talk Drew into getting a draft of that early script for me. Uh, if you do, I would love to read it. Just don't let him listen to this episode because then he might say no. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Drew, you seem like a lovely person. I'd love to chat with you. This did not come together. If you guys are ever in the same place, I will make sure that happens. Okay. Believe me. I will say, though, I, I do, now that I've gone through these, I do want to dig up that episode of Fear itself that I don't think I saw in its initial run that him and Scott also wrote together. I actually do want to check out some of Scott's other work because, I mean, between mm -hmm. this and Cigarette Burns, like, these are the type of story ideas I would like to see what else they got. Yeah. Drew, when he's, like, writing about real life and stuff like that, when he's just writing prose... I think his writing is very, very strong. And mm. you can find that all over the internet. And Scott's great as a, I haven't read much of his work, but I've always gotten a real good impression of his prose as well. I will say, like, even reading the script, like the other patients in the clinic, you have the young woman there, you have the family there. They came off better on the page than they did on screen. On screen, they feel like the cast of the Langoliers. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It just doesn't work. It did feel very langoliers -y, very empty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, pro-life. I'm not pro-pro-life. I am very pro-choice in the choices <laughs> to not watch it again. <laughs> All right. Sorry. I'm sorry, Drew. I will say both of these episodes of Masters of Horror make me want to go back and watch Body Bags again. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because Cigarette Burns was great, but Gas Station... <laughs> that is in my top five Carpenter. Yeah. And hair, I can't remember if it was hair or bad hair day, is better than this. <laughs> yeah, it was. Even Luke Skywalker's butt was better than this. Luke Skywalker's butt is always better than that. <laughs> it's better than a lot of things. We got more really. than just his butt in that one. <laughs> oh, I'm writing that shit down. Don't forget that ball sack. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> you got an eyeful, did you? That was not the eye we were expecting to see. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa, thank you again for joining us. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. I feel like this is going out on such a sad note. <laughs> yeah, I know. I have no energy for this particular venture. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's some way we can pep it up before we go. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to the latest episode of Masters of Carpentry. We discussed pro-life, so you don't have to. Yahoo! We'll see you next time on this show that you are listening to right now. See you in the ward. Cue the kazoos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah! Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklocke.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com.
Did I tell you I've recently been watching Beauty and the Beast? No. No, you hadn't. It doesn't hold up that well, but oh, is he wonderful in it. Yeah, I mean, the, that was always my impression of it in the 80s. Like, I tried watching a couple of episodes. I was like, eh, it's not my thing, but oh, that guy. Yeah. That guy's got a thing going. I can see why everyone from my mom's generation kind of swoons a bit every time they see Ron Perlman. Well, yeah. Or lions. Yeah. He is literally Lion Fabio. Oh, goodness, <laughs> yes, he is. Yeah, I remember seeing, I think it was a Starlog, where they profiled him in conjunction with the new show, Beauty and the mm. Beast. And it was interesting seeing the side-by-side comparison of him with makeup and him without makeup. Mm-hmm. And everybody's like, yeah, he's kind of a funny looking guy, but wow, he works that makeup really, really well. Yes. I remember because even as a little kid, I saw bits and pieces of Beauty and the Beast. So I, like, I always had that in my mind. And then like years later, I'm like, wait, that's the guy? Mm-hmm. But then, boy, have I grown on just Ron Perlman as Ron Perlman. Because Ron Perlman. As you should, because Ron Perlman is amazing. I can't remember if Todd Holland did an episode of Matches of Horror. I don't recall. Maybe he did Fear Itself. I can't remember, but I thought he did one of them. I mean, he's still around. Yeah, I don't think he did season two. But yeah, to go from Fright Night to Langoliers. Anyways, that's a whole different discussion. Mm. (laughs) But yeah. That's a different podcast, Noel. Yeah. Yeah. That's going to be my upcoming series, A Trip to Holland. (laughs) Of course.